Hello and welcome to this week's Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's current affairs programme. My name's Emma Webb and this week I'm joined by the director of the New Culture Forum, Peter Whittle, Philip Kisseli, who is a senior fellow at the New Culture Forum, and Alp Memet, our special guest today from Migration Watch. So this week there has been a lot in the news about immigration. Would you like to kick us off by explaining a little bit about this, um, th this announcement of Liz Truss's intention to um, to, sh shall we say, loosen the immigration rules. Yes. Um, the funny thing is that the system has already been loosened to the point of ridiculousness. Mm. It's absolutely absurd that we should be looking to loosen it even further. It reminds me of uh, Peter Mandelson when uh, in 2014, I think it was, or 2013, he referred back to the start of the century when he said, we're sending out search parties. We were sending out search parties for migrant workers. That seems to be what Liz Truss is proposing now. It's absolutely absurd and certainly very unconservative. So what she wants to do, essentially, as I understand it, is she wants to loosen the immigration rules in order to help kickstart the economy to stimulate, she thinks it will stimulate growth. Mm. Um, and she wants to do this by having what looks like freedom of movement with countries like, is it in India and Nigeria? Well, I don't know about Nigeria if there's a trade deal in the offing with them, but certainly with India, bearing in mind that the population of India is almost one and a half billion, yeah. which is three times mm -hmm. the size of the EU. We spent 40 years complaining about free movement not quite 40 years, but certainly the last 20 years, complaining about free movement. And here we are voluntarily placing ourselves in exactly the same situation with a country that's considerably poorer, I might mm -hmm. add, than the EU. Of course they will come here if they've got the opportunity. It, it really beggars belief. And this is a U-turn, isn't it? Because before this point, the Conservatives have been talking about um, low skilled immigration and in terms of wage depression and actually being the opposite mm. of stimulating growth. Mm. So what do you think accounts for this sudden U-turn with Liz Truss thinking that this is going to boost the economy in some way? I don't think actually, and I don't know whether Alp would agree with this, but I don't think it's actually a U-turn. I think it's a continuation and an intensification because um, from what I can see is that whatever they might have said, whatever the rhetoric was, um, the immigration system was liberalised considerably mm -hmm. in the past three or four years. Mm -hmm. But their manifesto pledge was to, oh, even though actions speak so louder young. than words, <laughs> but their, 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 their um, uh, manifesto pledge was to lower net migration. And Suella Braverman and Kemi Badenoch yeah. have, have criticised the government for this on the grounds that they are basically going back on. So Boris Johnson's... It, last speech at the, at the Conservative Party conference yeah. where he made it very clear yeah. that he, there was a relationship between low-skilled migration yeah. and wage suppression. So actually this doesn't stimulate growth. I mean it represents, sorry to... Uh, no, no, I, I was going to say let Philip have a word. <laughs> it, it just represents um, a, a vote of no confidence really, doesn't it, in, in British industry and, mm -hmm. and the development of the top end of British industry. It's almost as though we're, we're, we're sitting back on, on low skills and just, and just you know, waiting to die in a way, you know. Um, I heard it, um, and this was just on the back of the, uh, the, the kind of mini budget, wasn't it? And I was kind of quite buoyed by that, I have to say. And then I heard this news and I, I, I just felt a wave of despair. You know, I thought that's mm -hmm. the future gone, mm. you know? Um, it just felt as though I just wanted to, uh, I was just saying to Peter before, I just wanted to put my, my fingers in my ears and close my eyes and go, no, 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 no. It just seemed like a, an absolute vote of no confidence. Do you think this is a betrayal? Uh, it That's is a betrayal, betrayal. yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm. That's but another way of putting look, it. Just, just to go back to what Peter was saying, it is a continuation of, of what was going on. I mean, Boris Johnson was an avowed open door I'm a great fan of immigration, he said when he was mayor. He continued in that vein mm -hmm. when he became prime minister. In 2010, the Conservatives said that they would get immigration down to mm. tens of thousands. In 2015, they said exactly the same thing. In 2017, again, they would reduce it. Last time, they were going to control it, control 
and that would according to Boris Johnson also reduce immigration mm -hmm. it did no such thing and they knew it why they're doing it now allegedly is going to kickstart the economy well if we need to bring in cheap labor to kick kickstart to the economy heaven help us frankly mm. it will do no such thing cheap low scale low 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 skill low pay immigration actually costs the exchequer mm. it doesn't contribute to the exchequer and that in itself is going to be a problem because you've got all these mm -hmm. people coming in needing housing over their heads needing medical attention needing all sorts of services it's it's a disaster frankly and what what did you think about so um also in the news this week um the defeat of the legal challenge against the deportation of albanians because according to the home office I found this unbelievable. Six in ten of those crossing the channel yeah. are from Albania. Mm. Six that, in ten. Six mm. in ten. So these are not people who are fleeing from war-torn countries. They're coming mostly, it seems, from mm. Albania. Mm. So could you tell us a bit more about that legal challenge? Well, we have to be careful here. Um, the six in ten, that followed some sort of research investigation um, as a result of, of a leak, I believe. And it covered a particular period or mm -hmm. over a, a month or six weeks or something and during that period it seems that 60 percent of those crossing in boats were from albania now undoubtedly there are albanians coming now mm. uh, whether overall it's 60 percent albanians i just wouldn't like to say mm -hmm. nevertheless whether they're coming from albania or anywhere else they know that once they get into a dinghy the likelihood is that they will end up here and they will never go anywhere else for so long as they want to stay. What did you think of this, Philip? Again, it was it was just a, a wave of despair because it's um, I, I've I've been to Albania um, and um, it is pretty much a, a third world country, you know, uh, and and the the people who are coming over are male uh, and and there is a, a an ex-prison population that is coming over as well so i, I think don't... there was some mad statistic about how there are more albanians in or almost more albanians in british prisons than in albania yeah i, I, I i'm not quite sure about the statistics mm -hmm. so I, I i i wouldn't quote it but again it's the same thing and, and if you think about that and you think about it on the back of what's been going on in Leicester, what's been going on outside the Iranian embassy, we're just importing a whole load of the world's trouble and having to deal with it and dealing with it badly as well. I have to say actually on that point, it's very interesting when you see the, the way that the police react to those demonstrations, the kind of softly, softly approach they take, you know, whatever your view on vaccines or the pandemic the way that those people were treated in their demonstrations mm -hmm. as opposed to the way that these people are being treated well it's yes. ideological policing it's a, it's a two-tier two system two-tier two-tier policing mm -hmm. but i think the thing is what worries me about this summer really is is that i think i've sort of alluded to it is that there are there's this two strains on the con what you might call the conservative side of looking at it one is that we are a nation and that we are a country with a history and mm. all of those things the other one sees the balance sheet alone mm. right mm -hmm. free marketeer fundamentalists right they don't really care about immigration they don't really understand patriotism i don't think they don't even understand those sorts of very unquantifiable mm -hmm. things or rather they don't care about them and that seems to be the approach that seems to have have won mm. actually it seems well, to well they those those people don't see the country as a country with all of those cultural and heritage mm. and history and all of those things. They, they see the country as a receptacle, don't they? That's, that's but even on is. that level, surely even if you were talking in, on an opportunist level, I'm still surprised that they actually announce this kind of thing mm. or let it be known that this is what they're going to do given the the level of public concern about mm -hmm. it it's, mm. it seems quite extraordinary do you think it, in, in some part it's suicidal on the part of the conservative party because obviously liz truss is modeling herself after thatcher in many ways mm. she thinks that if she if she comes out with unpopular policies that work then eventually well, she'll, she, she'll, will be she will be she'll mention it now well. rather than mention it in a year's time I but, suppose. but 
do you think <coughs> that that is actually unwise and that you know Liz Truss is not Margaret Thatcher it's and even Margaret Thatcher I mean it ha she doesn't have a completely um, sort of clean legacy in, in many people's opinions. Margaret so Thatcher was a conviction politician she had she had views she had ideas and she had a, a dynamism that moved forward Liz Truss is dressing up as Margaret mm -hmm. Thatcher. I was just looking at the, the Labour Party conference today and I was thinking, you know, has Keir Starmer got his uh, Paul Smith suit yet? You know, and uh, Liz Truss is dressing up like um, Margaret Thatcher uh, or playing the Margaret Thatcher card. It's like deja vu light, isn't it? You know, we want ideas. We want people yeah, moving thought, forward. I we don't want role play. I thought my parents had done that play. decade so I didn't have to. Well, yeah. <laughs> Emma, oh, sorry, Philip. Um, Call me Emma, it's all right. <laughs> 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 um, you can be whoever you want to be. Mm. <laughs> um, well, yeah, that's the way things are going, I'm afraid. <laughs> but look, I, my feeling is that this isn't just bad economics and bad social policy. It's actually bad politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what she is doing is actually um, putting a wedge between her and the people who elected the last the, the Conservative yeah. government in such droves wave goodbye only those three years ago. red wall seats now um, you can argue that well actually there's the blue wall and perhaps mm -hmm. they're looking to take care of that I, I don't think they will that would be extraordinarily unpopular in the red wall because there's so much concern the, about in, the, in the red wall the red wall has already said we're not voting Tory mm. again the mm. only way that she's likely to get them back is to actually be firm on immigration because yeah. that's what they mm -hmm. want. Mm. But surely there's almost nowhere in the country this would be popular except for metropolitan centres mm. like mm. London. Well, and, yes, and, they don't, and they don't vote for There's her a anyway. lot of seats yeah, exactly. around I mean, here. There's in the West Country, <coughs> uh, the ones where the Lib Dems might might win. So mm -hmm. there is an argument that says that um, you, you you can't forget those the, the sort of middle centre left within the Conservative mm -hmm. Party. They need to be brought on board as well. The fact is that unless they can persuade those who voted for them last time all to vote for them again, mm -hmm. it won't be that the North or whoever voted for them last time in the Red Walls is going to uh, uh, switch to Labour. They won't. But even if they, if a few do, and by and large they step back and don't vote for anyone or mm. vote for Lawrence Fox or Richard Tice or whatever, the fact is that will mean no majority mm -hmm. in these constituencies so they've lost but if you if you think the politics is bad and the policy is bad then what what is she playing out what do you think her intentions treasury. are treasury it's it's the the treasury going back many many years from my days as an immigration officer onwards they've always felt that high immigration is good it generates activity in the economy and that in itself is a good thing. But isn't that demonstrably untrue if it's low skilled immigration, which is what they would get from an open door policy with, well, with it, India? It, 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 it may generate activity in the economy. It may grow the, the economy. But the fact is that as it grows, so many people come in that the actual slice for you, me, Peter, mm -hmm. Philip mm -hmm. remains the same. Again, it's just the balance gets sheet. smaller. Mm -hmm. Well, it becomes a Ponzi screen. Scheme. Yeah, and absolutely. actually, that's yeah, that's a good segue because um, one of the other subjects we're going to talk about today is um, Georgia Maloney, mm. who is uh, has just been elected um, prime minister mm. in Italy, and she has made the point that uh, um, in terms of globalism, about us not just being, you know, not a, a digit basically on mm. a, on an into mm. some kind of balance sheet. Mm. So, what what is your view on um, her election? She's been in the headlines. She's been described mm. as being the most right wing leader since Mussolini, which I guess is something that anybody um, conservative in Italy is far, going to be told. Right. If, if you if you read any of the mainstream media uh, articles about uh, uh, when it, whenever it was Monday, uh, the word Mussolini was just mentioned over and over mm -hmm. and over. I think there was one article where it was mentioned about 15 times. Um, and, and she keeps being called a fascist. She's a Christian. Mm -hmm. You know, fascists aren't Christians. That's enough. Start. Yeah. <laughs> Um, she's a Christian. She loves her country. She's proud to be a woman. It's all of these things which are the most 
family and nation. Banal things in the world, really, or they were yesterday, and now they're far right. You know, mm -hmm. so if she's far right, then I'm far right, then you're far right, then most of the people in this country are far right. And that demonstrates how removed well, the mainstream media is, but the institutions are as well, because the institutions are all up in arms about it too. In fact, uh, the, B the BBC, I think it was on Radio 4, uh, the foreign correspondent woman, um, the level of, of bias was quite extraordinary in the reporting of that. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, she was almost screeching, you know, she was just yes. below that level of, uh, of total hysteria. Mm -hmm. It was bizarre. You well, know, she uh, said millions didn't vote for her, yes, exactly. ignoring the fact that millions <laughs> did. did. And Rod Little yeah. pointed out that there was no way on earth that would have been said mm. about a right wing, uh, sorry, a left wing politician. Also, what's very noticeable, just to, just to go off subject a bit, is that can you imagine if she were of the right political stripe mm. how the fact that she was Italy's first woman prime mm. minister would have been mm -hmm. the top story mm -hmm. and no actually, one's made anything about that and what about Ursula von der Leyen yes didn't she say well, of course if someone yes. like that is elected we have ways of tools we have tools we have tools yes. this is yes. very interesting Ursula so unter den Linden. she's yes. actually the f not only is she the first um, female prime minister elected in Italy but she's also the first elected prime minister within 14 years. Yes. And I just find that astounding. I mm. wasn't aware of mm. this, but mm. Italy hasn't had an elected leader since 2008 because system. of the EU. Yeah. Mm. They have these little backroom deals mm. and they mm. decide who's going to run the mm. country. And Berlusconi was essentially mm. ousted by the EU mm. and replaced with somebody who I think had been formerly in the EU commission. Mm. Um, so I, it, what was so um, incredible about Ursula von der Leyen's comments is that she was basically saying that that uh, countries like Hungary, Poland, and Italy, yeah, the, if they if they started to go in a direction that wasn't desirable, mm. um, democratic, mm. um, then they have tools available, which is the most authoritarian thing she could Absolutely. possibly have mm. said. Mm. Um, but she's trying to tar. Maloney as being the authoritarian. And also you can't get rid of uh, Ursula by voting, can you? No. I mean, no one voted <laughs> which is her the key in. Point. Which is the key point. Yes, no one voted her. No. Most people don't even know who she is. So washed even. up on the shores of the EU. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, what, 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 what I find interesting, sorry Phil, what I find interesting before you, is as well as that one thing, look, you mentioned it there, you know, you've got uh, um, uh, Maloney, you've got the Swedish Democrats recently, you've got Viktor Orban, these people, and it's usually before oh but they have proportional representation but uh, apparently in Italy it's only half and half it's like mm. half proportional mm. half first past the mm. post which should make us think well in fact surely therefore the game isn't up mm. with us mm. you mm -hmm. know because that's always put forward isn't mm. it as a reason why other parties don't make yeah. it here. Mm. and actually I think not <coughs> that long ago they had a very very tiny um, minority of the vote share mm. Mm. So they've really risen quite quickly. But it is worth pause for thought this, isn't it? Because we've got Hungary, we've got Sweden, now we've got Italy. Mm. This really is mm -hmm. the road back to Europe. And actually, way, as, you, as you were saying before, I mean, even though her party has historical roots in a post-fascist party, I think is, mm. is right, um, the, the values that she's actually espousing in her speeches mm. and obviously I don't know if any of you can speak Italian I know I can't and so I'm not 100% sure of everything that she said but just from looking at things that have been translated she stands for the family she yeah. stands for the nation she call. stands for biological sex mm -hmm. she stands for things that everybody yesterday had complete consensus on um, but do you know what the key thing is about her she speaks as though she believes it and she's mm. authentic mm. unlike Th that's unlike the key the, thing she's authentic unlike the bureaucrats mm. who've previously been in charge and, mm. and generally uh, the ones that the eu tends this, to prefer this, this comes back to my point she's about a working class mother she's not high you know educated to a very high level but it comes back to my, but my she's point extremely intelligent and very charismatic my point about liz truss and keir starmer you know they're playing at being you know tony blair and margaret mm -hmm. thatcher they're not authentic at all you know there's no fresh you know dynamism there there's no new ideas this woman is it's it seems to me completely image yeah it, <laughs> but, but I just it's just this woman is being herself and she's mm -hmm. telling people from the heart what they want to hear it's fantastic just one point. Um, can I just draw attention to the fact that, be it Sweden, be it uh, Italy, 
uh, be it Hungary, the issue that has actually propelled this success mm. for the rise of centre parties, mm. should we say, mm. has been immigration. Yes, absolutely. And that really, I'm not sure that it's going to be possible to uh, um, elect that sort of uh, party into government here but that in a way is also going to add to the frustrations mm. and the angst mm -hmm. that is going to be felt and is being felt by but what we, we don't need a party what we want is a grassroots movement mm. to to push the Tories into being conservative that's what we really need we yes need the, 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 I would agree with that but the thing is, is just like with Brexit is that um, you, you have to um, frighten them with with an electoral yeah. mm -hmm. tool. I mean, in the mm -hmm. sense that the only thing that makes them move is the thought that they might lose their seats, mm. um, and that's that's what happened with Brexit. You mm. know, Cameron gave that referendum mm. when, in fact, it really looked seriously that they might lose lots of seats because UKIP was twenty three percent or something. Mm -hmm. So I would agree with that. You know, well, I'm, well, I'm, it, it, it's one step at a time, isn't it? It's a grassroots movement first, which may emerge into something like a yes. UKIP or a Brexit party or something like that. You but we, we need the grassroots movement first. A, grass move, a grassroots movement that then ha elects people, yeah. for want of a better. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm perhaps I'm, I'm foolishly naive. Um, I, I think that at the moment the only possible solution to our problems with regard to immigration are the Conservatives. They've got to be made to see sense. And I, I, I understand what you're saying, Peter, that if there's pressure placed on them through others being uh, denying them success, then they might change their minds. My feeling is that as we get closer to the election, they will see sense. Mm. And there are those on the Conservative backbenches, and there are within Cabinet. Uh, Suella Braverman clearly mm. Is, is not of the view that we should be opening up the floodgates mm. to immigration from all over the world. But going from that to actually having the policies that are going to have the, the right sort of impact, we're a long way from that. And we've got to make, do what we all can mm. to persuade the Conservatives just to change and to promise and keep mm -hmm. their promises with regard to immigration. Are there any, in, ter in terms of Maloney, the Swedish Democrats, um, Orban. Je Orban. Are there any criticisms that you have, particularly of of Maloney or any of these recently elected figures, that you would sort of contrast with what you would want to see here in the oh, UK? Sure. I mean, look, you, you, very rarely does one, at least I speak for myself, take on the whole no, kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as it were, every sim single plank of a policy. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, sure there are. I don't particularly like uh, uh, Orban's uh, attitude when it comes to Ukraine, for example. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there are certain, I'm not sure about Maloney, I don't want to speak out of term, but I mean like anti-abortion maybe, things like this. I, you know, I'm far more ambivalent on those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, but there, there comes a point where you sort of think, well, actually on this compelling issue, I've got to be with this person mm. or that person. All mm -hmm. I can say is that when she was actually, I had a slight, there was a sort of feeling of kind of hope. I sort of thought, wow, mm -hmm. you know, this is Italy, this is a Western European country, it's not a, a, a Central European country. And that was what, and then it was completely, um, you know, slashed uh, away uh, by this, this announcement of this mm -hmm. government mm. that we're actually going to loosen our immigration control. Do you think this is Europe's sort of Brexit Trump moment, that they're having their sort of revolt against the elites in a number of these countries? Do you think, if, if you do think that's what's going on, would that have a kind of international effect of pressure on the UK government? That they might see that if, for example, they do go ahead with this policy to loosen immigration, which I'm interested to know whether you think that's actually going to happen, whether it's really possible, because the idea of you know, opening the doors to potentially one, uh, one point five billion people seems outrageous. Um, that 
you know, that that might create some kind of international pressure on the UK and it might make them give it a second sort because I, they might think, well, maybe this is really is going to make us almost permanently unelectable. I, I, th I, think it's, I think it's too early to tell yet, but I think that one of the things that will be a, a key feature is, is the presidential election in, in America and see mm -hmm. what happens then because that might well change the, the mood music, especially if Trump comes back. Can I ask why we're still sort of on the on the on this subject of immigration? Uh, but you you might be able to help. Um, we had a census, didn't we, uh, in March two thousand twenty-one, um, which is going to be, I imagine, quite startling. I I've no idea. But why haven't we heard anything from it since? Can you sort of? Well, I gather we we are going to hear <coughs> uh, sometime in November. The, the latest set of figures but we have actually heard quite a bit already yeah. that in 10 years the population of this country grew by three and a half million mm. 10 years 10 years three Birmingham's in That's just 10 years extraordinary. and we know from our own analyses that something like 80 percent plus of that was due to immigration mm. immigration direct and indirect children born to to those who've come here and that that just cannot go on it's interesting in the in the context of the co cost of living crisis that you know we hear the phrase a lot and it's being discussed almost constantly but we don't talk about pressures on housing we don't talk about as we were saying earlier, the fact that unlimited, unskilled immigration suppresses wages at the mm. lower end mm. of the wage spectrum. So the idea that in, in the cost of living crisis, that the Conservatives would charge in with a policy like this, which would increase more pressure on the people who are at the, at the mm. pardon the language, the bottom of that economic mm. rung, mm. just seems unbelievable. Mm. And also a betrayal. Well, yeah, no, no, absolutely. It is it is a betrayal because it's broken promise after promise after promise. I, I, the, the Conservatives at the moment, frankly, are in, in a circle and, and running round chasing their own tail. Round, around the they really <laughs> don't know what they've got to do next. There are those who actually do get it, do understand, not just on immigration, in other areas as well. However, it seems that number 10, apart from the fact that um, we've, we've taken the route that we have with regard to liberalising the economy mm. and giving taxes, which I think uh, are a good thing, whether um, they're going to have the desired effect within two years come the next election, I'm not so sure. You see, they're being very optimistic. They're being very op optimistic. And in the end, if they want to win the election, mm. they better get their act together on immigration. I mean, ultimately, I would say that wouldn't I? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> ultimately as well. I mean, what's going to happen? The low skilled workers will stay here, but uh, people with very high skills. I'm talking about postgraduate students here, who who come here in massive numbers, and most of the postgraduate taught postgraduate students in this country actually are from other countries. They're not. They're certainly not British. Uh, they come. They learn then they go they take those skills elsewhere so that dynamic seems to be a ludicrous dynamic to me and any government that is uh, happy with that or even pushing that dynamic is is you know there's no reason for us to be optimistic about any of this frankly can, can i differ on that slightly philip that they do leave but if you look at um, those who are granted settlement mm. something like 20 percent of those are, uh, they start the whole process by arriving as students. Mm. In addition to that, they now also, and, and we, we've got around 600,000 um, overseas students here, <clears throat> they can stay on after they complete their studies mm. for two years to mm. work. I mean, that's, uh, people seem to overlook the fact mm. that they, they can stay here to work any job. Mm. They're not all going to become engineers and brain surgeons they do menial jobs just for the sake of staying here by and large in addition to that 
there's something like 80,000 family members mm. who are now coming yes, which as is, well. which is massive. But there is one demographic that Huge. doesn't tend to do that, and it's a massive demographic, and that's the Chinese demographic. They absolutely take their skills right back to China. Was that, so you, you mentioned the family members coming over, was that a recent loosening of immigration rules? Uh, yes, yes, because it's mostly postgraduate students who are bringing mm. those um, mm. family members in, mm. and that it was something like twelve thousand. And in the last set of figures we've got available for, I think twenty twenty one, it was eighty thousand. Huge. Is, That's there incredible. Is, I, I cannot see any justification for students bringing dependents or family members. Mm. I, I just can't see it. I think this will come as a bit of a shock to many people. Well, especially. I suppose there are various levels. It doesn't yeah. tend to be, uh, you, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I don't think it tends to be taught MA students. It tends to be PhD yeah. students and research students. Which is more it? understandable. And they, and they might like well be any age. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. You're right. It is mostly, I don't know about MA, but it is mostly postgrads, and we, we've got a lot of them. I think part of the problem is the fact that there are a lot of universities now Mm. They're, they're not all brilliant, however, um, they are, they're becoming increasingly dependent, if they haven't already become dependent, on overseas students, mm -hmm. higher fees and, and all that. And that, I'm afraid, is one of the drivers of bringing in more mm. and more um, young people. I worked overseas giving s visas to students who wanted to come here. I, I know that they're not all coming here to be aspiring Einsteins. They're just, mm. Mm. It just there's a little bit there's a little realistic. bit of cult, there's a little bit of cultural tourism around it. Yeah, and you know, but they they they, they come here for as, as well for the uh, for the piece of paper that's from a, a, an English university that that does have currency in 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 places like China. You know. Let's let's briefly touch on. Um, you had one final. Uh, point. I, one, one final point. Um, th there's something called this, uh, uh, um, the shortage of occupation list, the SOL, and there's a there's a drive now to expand that. If you go on, if a particular sector says you know there's a shortage of, I don't know, uh, um, care workers, for example, let's let's put them on the list. And you say, well, wait a minute, um, have we tried actually paying a little bit more and changing the conditions? But the fact is that for anyone on the shortage of occupation list, it means that they can brought in unlimited numbers at 80% of the going rate in this country. Mm. And it's uh, another aspect to that um, before we move on is that there are a very large number of vacancies in this country but an even larger number of people who are unemployed. And one of the problems and one of the reasons, one of the arguments against bringing in unlimited um, migration to fill those roles is that it means that the government can get their growth without actually investing mm. in the people who are already here and getting them into work and creating a more efficient system. I think I read somewhere that one of the, uh, one example of how certain areas of work have become more efficient is that at the turn of the century we had um, electric car washers and now we have loads of hand car washers yeah. and that's something that a lot of has de de yeah. declined in efficiency quite dramatically so actually if the government wanted long-term growth and weren't just thinking in terms of electoral cycles mm. then they would invest in the British public but instead they want that quick hit mm. They want the they're sort of, sort of a Deliveroo government. They want it. They want it now so that they can save themselves it's in the next cheaper. election. It's cheaper. We've just finished some work on um, the medical sector, and the number of doctors who can train here is limited. The numbers of overseas trained doctors in the NHS, the proportion is probably higher than any other countries in Europe. It's cheaper. You don't have to train them. They've already been trained. They come over here and they're prepared to work for less. Mm. That's the cynical mm. bit of me that says that's the only reason we're doing that. It happens with nurses, with dentists, all sorts of areas. With nurses, here we are recruiting nurses from countries that frankly need them a great deal more than we do, short as we are.
And I suppose just to, just to finish that point as well, at the other end of the uh, of the pay scale is uh, people working in care homes. So that's very cheap mm -hmm. labour, and that mm -hmm. tends to come from Africa, I think, primarily. Uh, and 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 that is a, a, a we're a, we're an ageing population, aren't we? So it's a burgeoning it's a burgeoning market. Oh, are, are we? I mean, I think that you know this idea of, of basically forgetting any chance or just dismissing any chance of retraining uh, our own people here, um, that this is now more or less, it's not even lip service given to this anymore. Uh, that is a huge betrayal, as I see it, mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Of, of future generations, or indeed present but generations. Young people here. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and quite extraordinary, actually, that it's sort of almost openly admitted. And I suppose the reason being is that the, the rot is very, very deep, isn't it? So if you actually are going to start doing that, training people, you know, our own people, you're going to have to change the education system. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to change this and that mm -hmm. and this. And it goes on and on. That's too much, as you say, mm -hmm. for short-term merchants, mm -hmm. which is what politicians are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to have to move on um, quickly because we're running out of time. But uh, Peter, do you want to tell us a bit about this British Attitude Survey? British Attitudes. Uh, what, from what I can gather, Emma, uh, is that basically it's been drawn up by people who seem to work in a certain paradigm. This <laughs> is something that comes up every year. Is that right? Mm. Um, and um, I think one of the conclusions drawn from this survey was that most people feel that mass immigration has been economically and culturally beneficial to Britain. And I just, so, I'm sorry, search me, but I just don't know how they came up with that. Um, but that is one of the headline the questions, results of I it. think one of the complaints is that the questions were leading and the categories were confused. So I've got a quote here. It's like literally, um, are you, as Joe Brand used to say, are you a fat bastard? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, are you a racist bigot? No. So they, they in, in their section on the culture wars, they set up this yeah. dichotomy basically yeah. of nasty versus nice. It's, it's like, it it's like a Manichaean framework of good versus evil was, and we're it was, horrible. It was yeah. liberal versus authoritarians yeah. and the authoritarians weren't regarded it was the it's liberals the, it's who the wrong were woke way around yeah and the authoritarians mm. who were anti-woke yeah. um, and it, uh, there's a quote here from um, Gareth Roberts who wrote a great piece in the He's spectator yeah. um, on this and he said this is an extreme example of the public sphere using 20th century words for 19th century concepts <laughs> in a world altered beyond recognition referring to political divisions in terms of liberal mm. versus authoritarian and quite possibly left and right is about as much use as describing metaverse programming in the vernacular of the battle of trafalgar <laughs> <laughs> but you know there's I'm lots sorry, of I've lost me there a bit actually well, <laughs> the, the, there are lots of lefty lawyers on twitter saying well you know it's just caring it's nice it's it's being respectful to people what's wrong with that and uh, you know I, I think you know uh, you don't think that you know that's a lie we know that's a lie we know that you know that that's a lie but you'll dissemble anyway and that's how woke works it's about dissembling it's, it, it's lies and but it's barefaced mm -hmm. brazen lies. and it's interesting though how this can be used in this instance in the British Attitude Survey that this framing can be presented as being something mm -hmm. that is objective when it's completely leading and it completely, not only does it skew the, the real it's meaning of the down. findings, it's, it's, it's actually twisted yeah. it completely yeah, totally, topsy-turvy. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, this business of people thinking that more positive about immigration, we kept hearing that time and time and time again. So last July, we commissioned some polling um, from Migration Watch uh, done by Delta Poll very respectable and actually something like 60 percent of people thought that immigration had been too too high and needed to come down among conservative voters it was over 80 percent for yeah. goodness sake so yeah. you know i i just don't as as you say if you ask a straight question you will get a straight answer mm -hmm. If you try subterfuge and and trying mm. to uh, disguise what it is that you're really saying to get the right answer, mm -hmm. that can also happen, it's and it, that's what's it's going on throughout. It's interesting to to call on the name of this program. It's interesting news speak, isn't mm. it? To prefer basically to the advocates of free speech as being 
authoritarian yeah. and those who want to clamp down on yeah. free speech yeah. as being liberals yeah. um, it's just completely the wrong way around last week we were talking about the PayPal yeah. PayPal's decision to yeah. close down the free speech union account now yeah. they've reinstated it after loads of backlash and pressure yeah. against them um, including support from various um, MPs who are in support of the free speech union yeah. and according to the framing of this British attitude survey according to this um, spectator piece that I mentioned they would have been regarding basically those who were pro-freedom as being the ones on the side of authoritarianism yeah. ah. well, well I mean well, sorry go on. well I, I was going to say it isn't just people like Peter you and Philip who um, think that immigration is high and needs to be reduced by a lot 34 percent think by a lot it's also people like me, migrants, mm. and not just those who've been here for uh, an eternity as I have, but those who've come more mm. recently. Mm. The fact is that uncontrolled mass immigration has an impact on everything, everything mm. including migrants here yeah. mm. and if we've got any sense we really do something And about also it. if we want to talk about being humane, those migrants that come through as part of that unlimited flow into those low skilled jobs they are also at the bottom of Being that economic exploited. rung yes. that are, uh, have all of that yeah. pressure bearing down on them as well Absolutely. along with everybody else Absolutely. who's already here. Absolutely. I'll just make one point about uh, British social attitudes uh, uh, on a very general basis I mean and that is that the general British attitude to immigration I think has been unbelievably tolerant totally. mm. and totally. unbelievably Absolutely. patient mm. and reasonable They've been treated unreasonably, mm -hmm. um, you know, for all their their trouble. Um, but th people can make the distinction quite easily between immigration, which I think most people have no problem with, you know, mm. like what you might call ordinary moderate migration, and unprecedented mass migration mm. of the type we've had in the past twenty years. Most people can make that distinction, mm -hmm. um, but increasingly, the powers that be blur this just mm. like they're blurring the language mm. I'm sure you'd you would uh, oh, support absolutely. me in that they're blurring the kind of the blurring whole language distorting it yeah. yeah I think the problem is most people will make that distinction in private but if you utter that distinction in public then you are just branded racist mm. and that's that's the real problem you know mm. and then you're you're just completely open to the kinds of people who are not interested in freedom of speech they're interested in freedom of spite aren't they they'll just call you any names uh, you know because because you say something completely reasonable and you say something that everybody else thinks and uh, you know i'm from an immigrant background myself as i've said lots of times on this show um and and, and you're an actually you know we're not against immigration we're against mass immigration and most well all sensible people are. Mm. So that's the note we're going to have to end on. And I think that's a message there for Liz Truss. It's unreasonable. So please do like, comment and subscribe. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alp. Thank you, um, Philip. And we will see you next time on Newspeak. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member you'll receive a range of benefits including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.